Have you ever wondered what kind of people become commercial fishermen? I mean, if you, you know, watch movies or reality TV shows, they certainly present a certain stereotype, right? They're, they're not quiet or shy people, I would say. Tend to be on the, the big burly side, you know, guys who have personalities to match that and they can be, uh, their speech can be blunt, maybe a bit salty, uh, but they work super hard to get the job done. So, you know, it seems like a, a very different question to ask. What kind of people become church leaders? I mean, you would think it would be a very different personality type, right? But four of Jesus' 12 apostles were Galilean fishermen. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now, the Sea of Galilee is, is really just a big lake. I mean, it's not like the Great Lakes. It's about, it's, it's about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide, 50 feet deep. And so fishing there is certainly not the same as being out in the open ocean. But even today, you'll find commercial fishing boats like this one there on the Sea of Galilee. And sometimes they face sudden intense squalls because of just the way the weather interacts with the terrain there. So perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that Peter, in particular, often seems to fit that stereotype of the commercial fisherman, and yet he becomes the leading apostle. I mean, God uses Peter to lead thousands of people to faith in Christ. He writes two significant letters that are included in the New Testament. And they reveal his hope and his passion and his understanding of truth. But it seems to me that when we look at those and when we read about Peter, sometimes maybe we, once we get away from the Gospels, we, we lose sight. We forget that background of, of who he was as this maybe crusty fisherman. And so I think we need to to keep that in mind, we need to hear from this blunt fisherman turned apostle. I mean, why, why did Jesus become so important to him? How did this kind of practical down-to-earth guy think about life and faith? So I want to invite you to join me as we start into a study of his letters. Now, for this uh, first series, I've, I've titled it A Fisherman's Hope. And we'll focus on 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, chapter 2, verse 10. But before we start, even start into that, into Peter's first letter, I want to review some defining moments from Peter's interactions with Jesus that are recorded for us in the four Gospels. And um, I think Peter's story demonstrates three ways that Jesus changes people, changes believers. I mean, he clearly called Peter to something more than just being a fisherman. And so as we walk through these, I encourage you to consider whether these changes characterize your life. The first one, we could put it this way, uh, that Jesus brought about a new identity in Peter. One of the first words that children learn to recognize is their name, right? They hear that collection of sounds and somehow they begin to understand that's, that's me. <laughs> and so, you know, that name may have deep significance to their parents or maybe not, maybe they just like the sound of it. But over time, children develop a sense of who they are as a person and that identity is always linked to that name. Now, that's a good place to start in talking about Peter because he wasn't always Peter. And we'll see in a moment that, that Jesus gave him that name. Uh, and at first, it, it might have seemed like maybe nothing more than, than a nickname, a fun nickname. But it was really the first hint of, of a new identity a radically different self-understanding that Jesus was going to bring about in Peter's life. Now, Peter's Hebrew birth name was Shimon. In the New Testament, it's written as Simon, because Greek doesn't have that SH 
sound, or that there's a, there's a break there in Hebrew between the first part and the second. It's a shim om kind of a sound. And to make matters even more confusing, if you go to the Old Testament, that same name is translated as Simeon. Because uh, they try to represent that break by adding an E. It's a little confusing, but it's all the same name. And so if we go back to the Old Testament for a moment, who was uh, that original Simeon? Simeon was one of Jacob's 12 sons. He was the, the second boy born to uh, Jacob's wife, Leah. And of course, that's, that's almost 2,000 years before the time of Peter. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's honestly not a whole lot to, that we can say about Simeon as a person because he's always more in the background when you read through the book of Genesis. He's upstaged by his older brother Reuben and his younger brothers Levi and Judah or his half-brothers Joseph and Benjamin. And yet, his name really has this deep significance. It comes from the Hebrew word that means to hear. Genesis 29, 33 tells us the story. It speaks about his mother Leah and says, she conceived again and bore a son and said, here it is, because the Lord has heard that I'm hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. So Leah chose that name because she believed that God heard about her difficult marriage. He heard her prayers for a child. And as we know, the Lord hears all things. So it's really a great name. Maybe Peter's parents chose that name because maybe they had difficulty conceiving a child. Perhaps they saw him as the answer to their prayers. Or, or maybe another possibility is that they called him Shimon because they wanted him to, to hear and be a good listener. Uh, I mean, that's, that's important, right? Because listening to God's word is essential for spiritual growth. And one of the defining passages of, of Old Testament faith is in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 6. In fact, we call, it's called the Shema, right? The same word, that word here, because it starts and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Right? Maybe, that's, maybe that's what Peter's parents wanted for him. That <laughs> would be a great thing. And yet, the irony is that Peter doesn't seem to be a great listener. Right? That's, that's his name. His name means hear, right? <laughs> and yet, he's always the one who's quick to speak and not hear, uh, and he tends to put his foot in his mouth a lot. Actually, it's his brother Andrew who's probably the better listener, because Andrew was listening to John the Baptist teach, and he heard John point to Jesus and, and, and refer to him as the Lamb of God. And so Andrew's really the first one who begins to follow Jesus, and then in John 1, verses 41 and 42, it tells us he, Andrew, first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now that word Cephas comes from the Aramaic word for, for rock, right? Petros is the, the Greek translation. What did Jesus mean by that? Um, and, you know, what did Simon think at that moment? Here I just meet this guy and he starts calling me by a different name. Uh, I mean, we're not told the answer there. And uh, it, it does seem to be a little ironic to call Simon the rock, or rock, when, you know, he's a fisherman who spends most of his time in a boat trying to avoid rocks, or then again, his, I mean, maybe it's his blunt personality, I mean, maintaining a relationship with him would be rocky, <laughs> I, do, I, I wonder if Jesus was poking at him a little bit, but it's not really for a couple of years uh, that Jesus 
makes the significance of that name clear. It's over in Matthew 16, if you want to turn there. Matthew 16 tells us uh, the story, and you'll remember Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they told him, and then he asked, well, who do you say I am? And Peter responded and said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God which was great. That was true. And so it tells us in verses 17 and 18, Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but that statement has been the focus of quite a bit of debate in church history, exactly what Jesus was saying there. Because some people say, well, Peter himself is the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. And so that kind of becomes, or at least it's used as one of the main arguments for the authority of the Pope in the Roman Catholic Church, that, you know, that he's this foundation for the church. But in, in the Greek text of this passage, there is a distinction between Peter, Petros, and rock, Petra. Um, so it, it seems to me that really the rock that Jesus is talking about here is Peter's declaration. Right? The church is founded upon the, the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead, you know, as was going, of course, hadn't happened by, at this point yet. And so by changing Simon's name to Peter, in a way, I think what Jesus is really doing is identifying him by the gospel. Right? His, his name becomes tied into this idea of this foundational truth, the good news of who Jesus is and what he does. And the reality is that that message comes to define Peter's life. And that's how it should be for all of us, right? The most important thing about us is not, you know, our nationality or our job or our family or even our unique personalities. It's our relationship with Jesus as believers, because that connection changes us from being hopelessly condemned sinners to being forgiven heirs of eternal life. I mean, that, and so does the gospel of Jesus define your identity? If so, it should lead to another change, a second one. We see it in Peter uh, that Jesus gave him a new job. Now, people have fished with hook and line for thousands of years, but, of course, that's, that's a little slow for commercial fishing. And so they would tend to use, use nets to catch a greater quantity of fish, of course. And, um, you know, they'd seek out a spot where they thought they were, uh, hoped to find a big school of fish and cast their net in and drag them, drag them back out and I mean, Peter had probably done that thousands of times. I'm sure he, he knew the Sea of Galilee like the back of his hand. But in one of his early encounters with Jesus, Jesus demonstrates his power over Peter's normal job and redirects him to a brand new one. Uh, Luke chapter 5 is where we turn next. Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to read straight down through verses 1 through 10 tells us this story on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of god talking about jesus he was standing by the lake of gennesaret it's another name for galilee and he saw two boats by the lake but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets getting into one of the boats which was simon's he asked him to put out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the people from the boat and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. So after, you know, after this night of not catching anything, Peter knew that this abundant catch was clearly a miracle. And he had never experienced anything like it. The boats are so way down there. They're like about to take on water. But this revelation of Jesus' power helps Peter understand that he's in the presence of the Son of God. And so picture it, here he is in, his, in this old, I assume this old smelly fishing boat, right? And all of a sudden it's like that space that's so familiar, that's, you know, so common to Peter, really becomes holy ground, becomes this place of worship, and he feels convicted of his own sinfulness, and he bows down it says at Jesus' knees. I mean, typically you'd bow down at his feet, but they're probably buried under the fish. That's, uh, I think, what's going on here. And um, Jesus, Jesus tells him not to be afraid. Now, now, in time to come, Peter will learn more about how Jesus came to seek and save the lost. But I suspect that, at least in some sense, this experience must have change the way that Peter thought about fishing, right? I mean, this, it's like that artificial barrier that we all tend to erect between work and worship was just stripped away here. He saw God's involvement in everything, in every part of life. Now, it was certainly a unique situation. I mean, here's Jesus is there in the flesh, and yet we know that God is always present with all of us wherever we go. And so, I mean, we should always approach uh, everything we do, but, but particularly our work with a sense of holy reverence from a standpoint of, of worship. Paul talks about that in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. And yet that, I mean, Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't just want Peter to be a more spiritual fisherman, which is a, a great thing, but Jesus went beyond that in, in pointing Peter to something different. He, he gives him this a new job. He says he's going to start catching men. Um, over in Matthew's account, it's not exactly sure that it's the, the exact same moment. It might have been a, a different one, but it tells us he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And it says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, when you think about fishing, I mean, fish don't want to get caught, right? I mean, that, that should be obvious. They don't benefit from it in any way. They're not seeking it. Uh, they're seeking to avoid it. And yet, when you think about Fishing for men, catching people, is different than fishing for fish, right? It's, it's not about ensnaring people in some way or trying to, you know, capture them or control them in some religious system. It's about spreading the gospel, the good news, giving people an opportunity to hear about Jesus and to receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal salvation that will that will genuinely benefit them uh, in the best way possible. And so for Peter, this new job, at least the way what Jesus had in mind for him, required him to leave behind the old one. And he and the other disciples uh, join Jesus in this itinerant ministry as they go from place to place and village to village preaching the gospel. And that meant that, that allowed Peter 
and the other disciples to hear the teaching of Jesus and to witness his mere miraculous deeds. And that was all going to be vital for them uh, to draw upon later as they carry on his ministry after he ascends into heaven. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't call every believer to leave behind their job that way. But I think we can say that we're all called to be fishers of men who uh, spread the good news of the gospel about Jesus far and wide. Paul uses a different analogy. He describes our role as being ambassadors. In 2 Corinthians 5, he explains it this way, verses 18 through 20. He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. It says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So, if you follow Paul's reasoning there, if you've been reconciled to God, right, that happens by hearing this message of reconciliation. And once you've heard it and responded to it and been reconciled to God, then you've been entrusted with that message of reconciliation. Then our job is to represent him as an ambassador of his grace everywhere we go and in everything we do. And that means, that means that we can't, you know, hide out in our homes or in our church waiting for people to just come to us because, I mean, it's sort of be like a fisherman who doesn't want to go to the water but just wants the fish to come flopping up to his door, right? It, it, it doesn't work that way. And so we have to, part of this job is going out into the world, reaching out to people, encouraging them to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. What are we doing with that? I mean, you might feel intimidated by that, uh, that job, but that leads us to a third change that we see Jesus bringing about in Peter's life. Uh, to put it simply, we could just call it a new understanding one of my professors back in college described his job as shaking up people's boxes. And what he meant is that when we hear things, when we hear new ideas, we, we just naturally tend to sort them into different compartments, different categories, you know, true or false, right or wrong, certain or uncertain, important or unimportant, possible or impossible. And the reality is that once you've put something into one of those categories, we're very hesitant to move it. We, we don't like rethinking things. And in fact, we, we tend to gravitate to voices that just affirm what we already think. Uh, it's just easier that way. But sometimes for us to grow, we really do need to be challenged to, to move things around. And Jesus often challenges Peter this way. I mean, he gives him a new understanding of a lot of things. But as I think of Peter's life, there's two occasions that stand out to me. And they both show Peter the importance of faith. One occasion, it's in Matthew 14. Uh, it's recorded there. The disciples, of course, had just seen Jesus multiply the five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people. That was just this amazing lesson about the power of Christ. And then later that night, you may remember, he, he sends the disciples off across the lake while he remains behind, spends time praying. And then uh, they encounter intense wind and waves like we were talking about out on, out on Gal the Sea of Galilee. And they see Jesus walking on the water. And they're terrified. By it. So we pick up the story in Matthew 14, uh, verse 27. We'll read down through verse 32. It tells us, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, 
Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But then it tells us, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Now, again, Peter, he's a fisherman. He spent a lot of his life out on that lake in a boat. He probably never thought about walking on water in the category of the possible things that could happen, right? And yet here he, he learns that by the power of Jesus, it is possible. And yet he gets out there and with the wind and the waves and he begins to doubt. Now, what I think is interesting here is, of course, previously Jesus had rebuked the wind and calmed the storm, right? It's back in Matthew chapter 8. And he could have done that on this occasion. He could have just, you know, made it like glass. And yet, he doesn't. He seems to want Peter to trust him in the midst of the rough waters. Now, I'm not sure Peter grasped the importance of faith, of trust in that moment, of not doubting. I think like most of us, kind of our natural instinct is, is rather than just having to trust, we'd much rather be in control. <laughs> we'd like to just work out all the situations, you know, make, make life like that flat sea of glass. But Jesus clearly challenged that idea here, and, and he does so on another occasion. Right after that moment we talked about earlier, where Jesus talked about building his church on the rock, if you just keep reading in that passage, Matthew 16, uh, picking it up in verse 21, uh, down through 23, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. I mean, that's very clear, isn't it? The whole storyline is just, he was addressing all of that. And yet, I think you probably know what happened. It says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I mean, so remember, this is, this seems to be, at least as it's recounted here for us, right after Peter just said, you're the Messiah, the Son of God, and Jesus said, you're blessed. Peter talked about the rock. And so one minute he's commended for his declaration of faith, and then it's like the next moment, Jesus is likening him to Satan. <laughs> I mean, what a contrast. I mean, why is that? Because at least here in this moment... Peter refused to trust what Jesus was saying, to believe that Jesus knew what was going to happen and what needed to happen. Peter, I, I probably just thought, well, you're too powerful for that to happen. Right? I mean, he had always placed Jesus in the, the powerful Messiah box, the great coming conqueror box. The one whose side I want to be on, box. I mean, he probably just thought Jesus would take control of everything. He didn't grasp yet that Jesus needed to suffer, to pay the price for our sins, to purchase our salvation. Now, of course, the other disciples, at least as far as we can tell, are just silent watching all of this, right? Um, they... They weren't as blunt as Peter, but they probably had similar thoughts. And so as the passage continues, Jesus turns to the whole group. 
Matthew 16, 24 through 27. It tells us, and Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So Jesus will ultimately return to judge and to reign, but until then, those who follow him must be prepared for, for rough water. We have to be ready to follow in the footsteps of his suffering, and even if it means losing your life. That requires self-denial. It requires genuine faith, and yet it makes sense. If you're identifying with Jesus, right, and his gospel, and if you work for Jesus in being a fisher of men, it only makes sense that you would face the same kind of opposition and potentially the kind of suffering that he faced. So it comes down to this crucial question of, are you willing to entrust your life to him? Right? Not just for eternity. We, we, we like that part, but are you willing to entrust him with your life and well-being here and now as you go through life day by day? Are you willing to let him change your understanding of what's true and false, right and wrong, certain or uncertain, important and unimportant, possible and impossible? Because to follow Jesus is all about walking by faith, trusting his word, right? letting him guide the way. And so all that to say, Jesus called Peter to something more than just simply being a fisherman. He gave him this new identity, this new job, this new understanding of the importance of faith. And yet, Peter's transformation is still in progress at this point, right? I mean, the biggest change would come about through the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. And that's what we'll talk about next time. But for now, I encourage you to think about your life. I mean, has Jesus brought about these changes in you? Is that how you think about it? Maybe, maybe he's drawing you toward that today. ready to believe in him and start following him if you haven't already? Do you want to know more about Christ and what he asks of us, who he is? Uh, this, these chapters we've looked at, Matthew 16, and then also chapter 17 are, good, are a good place to read. But if you do, if you identify yourself as a believer, as a follower of Christ, then it just raises that question, is that how you live? Are you letting him really define your life and shape your understanding through his word? We need to take seriously that call to, to work for him, to live as an ambassador. And we should be praying for, for people, reaching out with the good news. May we live for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the encouraging thought that you transform lives. Father, that even when, or no matter what our background, it has been, that you can change us. You can make us a new creation. You can set us on a different path by your great power. Thank you for the, the hope 
that that gives. And Lord, we pray that you're transforming work would take place in us, that we would be willing and ready to change and to follow and to live for you. So help us, Father, help us to to grow, help us to be teachable. Lord, help us to live by faith. In Jesus' name.